member of the HCI um, Public Humanities Network. And it, um, I just want to welcome you all on behalf of that network um, to our conversation about uh, the new journal, Public Humanities, as you see, Scholarship with Fire and Footnotes. And um, we're really delighted to welcome the editors of this journal um, to speak with us about the journal, what they are expecting to uh, come from it and to do with it, and um, and also to entertain your questions about this journal. So I'll just very quickly introduce those editors uh, and then turn it over to them to talk to us. Um, Jeffrey Wilson is a Shakespeare scholar at Harvard University. He's the author of three books, Richard III's Bodies from Medieval England to Modernity, um, Shakespeare and Game of Thrones, and Shakespeare and Trump. Uh, that one sounds fascinating. Um, and our second speaker is Zoe Hope Bulaitis, is, who's an assistant professor of liberal arts and natural sciences at the University of Birmingham, Birmingham England. She is motivated by better articulating the value of the humanities in the 21st century in public life. Um, and then I, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and Zoe. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you, everyone, for coming and letting us share the exciting news about public humanities with you all. It's been, um, as I was saying in the chat before we started, a little while in the making. So we're going to today talk and share that story. Um, but before we start, I just want to give a massive thanks to the people who've made it possible to be here um, at this stage. Um, really, thanks to the staff supporting us at Cambridge University Press. That's uh, Georgia, Jess, Kerry, Hannah, Kin and Sally for their support in getting this off the ground in a kind of publishing terms. Um, so, yeah, hello. Um, Jeff's also here and um, I'm going to hand over straight away to him. We're going to tag team this and talk for about 15 minutes. Um, and then we'd really like to just open up for conversations, questions and um, to hear what you have to say or think or engage with around the things we raise. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Yeah, thank, thanks to Dave for helping organize logistics and Jessica for hosting, Aaron for helping us connect. Hello to some of our advisory board members out there. Thank you for your work on the journal. Uh, so today we'll be talking a little bit about mission, values, and rationale for the journal. We'll tell a little bit of our launch story about building the journal. We'll cover the issues that we're planning to launch in year one, which is extremely exciting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to get involved and a little bit of the future visions for the journal. So the mission of Public Humanities is to create a venue for sharing knowledge about the intersections of humanity scholarship and public life. And we go back to this mission statement often in our meetings, as well as the values that we'll talk about momentarily to help us kind of center ourselves, to help us set goals, help us make decisions, and help keep ourselves accountable and to keep the press accountable to the reasons that we got into this in the first place. Absolutely. So in terms of um, some of those values, we first of all um, would, would stand for truth, which is, as we interpret it, the greatest good um, at public humanities is an accurate representation um, and responsible interpretation of reality. Justice, which is fighting for the ethical use of power on all levels by individuals, organisations and governments. Education, sharing knowledge being a centrally important thing to what we're actually doing here, especially backward and forward across um, academic and public boundaries. Accessibility, prioritizing accessibility in a variety of forms, be that in terms of open access to knowledge, accessible writing styles, but also in terms of accessibility to people with disabilities. And inclusivity, the way we feel the success of public humanity should be measured is about the diversity of people and perspectives that appear in the journal and feel seen in the journal. We also value cross-disciplinarity, holding that complex human problems require multiple angles of humanistic interpretation across the disciplines. Internationality, we want to represent the fullness of humanity around the world by inviting readers, topics, and authors from all nations equally. We value expertise, so promoting the value of bridging specialized training and knowledge, bringing that to bear on emergent issues of public concern. Collaboration. So we hold that truth, justice, and education, those three core values, are higher quality when they are co-created by multiple people in conversation. And engagement. So we support scholars who transcend traditional academic spaces to engage with society in active and new ways. 
So if that's what we're setting out to do, I think that a sense that we also wanted to get across was around why we wanted to do this. There are great, great kind of global challenges and, and a need at the moment and ever uh, and as ever for humanity's knowledge to be freely available in public life. We think this connects and speaks to many areas of public life, including education, health, law and justice, civil rights, care, conflict, democracy and the environment. And so what we wanted to do was to build a meeting place where a diverse set of disciplines, professions, perspectives and people will come together beyond the closed off circles that are sometimes facilitated by academic paywalls in publishing uh, or otherwise clubs and cliques. So public humanities is really about um, breaking down those boundaries and sharing knowledge across those borders. We also really wanted to found a journal that created a space for consolidation for the field of public humanities research and work, which, you know, is, is a way which young young scholars and scholars further along their careers might find a way to survive within and and, and there's a reaction against cuts to the humanities so there were these two strands one really about the global and societal need for this work and another for providing a space for researchers to to articulate that work for themselves so i come from the world of shakespeare studies where there's this tension between historicism and presentism so historicism studying the way things were versus how Shakespeare surfaces today in society. So I wrote an article called Historicizing Presentism for MLA's profession issues on public humanities. Uh, the end of that article is just kind of a, a little bit brazenly just argued for the a journal of public humanities would be a good thing for us as a scholarly community to have. I got contacted by Holly O'Neill at Cambridge University Press. Um, so we had coffee on my campus and, and we found out we shared a lot of values. We shared a little bit of a vision of what a journal of public humanities might be. But then months turned into years and the conversation kind of fizzled out. It was, it was just too hard to see, practically speaking, how we'd be able to make this journal. So to kind of take a step back to where I started into this journey, um, my first interest in career was actually journalism. And I've always had an interest in how you communicate ideas with a with a wide public. Um, I actually was the editor of the student newspaper when I was an undergraduate and very much enjoyed the, the scoop on campus and so on. Um, I did eventually, after interning at some newspapers, realize that I appreciated longer form um, types of writing and found the satisfaction of uh, research uh, alluring, which kind of led me down the career that I, I now pursue in academia. Um, but I did keep my hand in publishing industry. You know, I worked as an um, editor, um, a books editor for the Journal of American Studies during my, my graduate studies, and then more recently have been involved in the open access wonder house of the Open Library of Humanities, which is um, one of the leaders in humanities uh, open access publishing. And I was really proud to um, deputy edit C21, which is their contemporary literature journal. Um, so I think that really part of my work in the in coming into this project is about that debate around open access and bringing that into areas of scholarly communication. I'm also a scholar of value. So my first monograph is actually entitled Value in the Humanities. And I'm really interested in how knowledge intersects with the economy and economic forms. I was uh, contacted by by Holly through some work I was doing with Sarah Dillon, who is a professor of public humanities in the UK. And we were talking a lot at that time around humanities evidence and how you evidence value in the humanities. And we kind of connected with Holly on those grounds about some work we were doing there. So we met Jeff um, on Zoom, as we are today in our, in our natural environment, Jeff. Um, and we got to talking about this and really pick up the momentum and, 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 and work up this idea with, with new momentum um, starting in uh, I think it was October 2021, we we formally started kind of getting this thing going again. Um, but we spoke a lot about national context for change, about widening that experience of public humanities scholarship beyond North American context. And um, for many meetings after the next two and a half years, we, we kept that mission going. So yeah. when we got together and then Zoe and I and Holly and others at the press kind of connected, we had this sort of shared aspiration. And, and there were four things that we wanted to accomplish. We wanted a journal that would be open access, would be peer reviewed, would be speedy in delivery to readers, and would be financially sustainable for the press. And those were four priorities that were actually quite difficult to figure out how to make them coexist. So that was our aspiration. The, ch the challenge was finding the right business model that would allow us to do all four of those things. We went through a lot of trial and error. So we... 
we were out exploring options for getting an angel donor who would come in and drop $500,000 and, and fund this thing that, that would, would sustain us. Um, we were looking at institutional sponsors, you know, the, the universities that have resources or, or outside uh, corporations that, that might sponsor these things, but just nothing was seeming to work. The kind of way we navigated through this seeming impasse of how to make this journal off the ground actually came through wider work happening at Cambridge University Press around transformative agreements, which for those of you well versed in open access law will know are agreements between um, institutions and, and, and presses, which allow for scholars to read and publish in journals without facing individual APCs, which is article processing charges. We we're excited that there was this work happening at Cambridge Press, but we also were um, adamant that this work needed to kind of cover all potential authors. We didn't want to create an environment of elitism where some could afford to publish and others couldn't. To get this model off the ground, we have designed and iterated the idea of a guest themed issue. So with this, there were a, a, a sort of several good things that, that, that were one financially sustainable in the sense that we can commission guest editors to help um, put together these issues in ways that the press can kind of agree to fund kind of unilaterally but also it really represented a challenge that we've been speaking about intellectually about the breadth and depth of humanities research how is it that we offer content that is um, accessible and interesting to many publics but yet also enables for uh, scholarly rigor for synthesis of complicated ideas of multiple voices, interests and expertises. So it was really about getting that right balance in terms of the economic model, but also in terms of the actual content that the journal will produce. And I think that the idea of the themed issue as at least half of the work of the journal, and we'll talk about the other half in a minute, really helped us pull those things together. Um, we also really importantly wanted that model to be one that uh, reimburses those involved in the academic labor of putting together an issue and and made sure that there was some you know financial reimbursement for authors who stepped up to that task of uh, guest editing an issue. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit more about why Cambridge University Press because you know it, it was something that certainly was harder in terms of getting off the ground and convincing them for a few reasons that I'll, I'll speak about. Um, the thing that I think first of all attracted us towards conversations with the press was this idea of a sustainable tool for the community, long running and, 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 and sort of very rigorous in its archiving processes. We were really excited about the idea of having resource, but also longevity for public humanities work rather than happening as, as an event or a passing moment as being kind of an archived project. I think personally, uh, something I was really passionate about as well was getting public humanities into, into the perceived center or, or kind of mainstream and thinking about the press and, and the word Cambridge, obviously, with its affiliations of being a marker of high quality, which enabled for a conversation about the kinds of public humanities work to be balanced against perhaps some of those pressures around esteem and publishing locations. So I think that it also makes public humanities visible to people who might have not thought about it for them as well. I mean, we really hope the journal is a space where academics in all kinds of different careers can, can write and, and think about the relationship of their work to the public. And then finally, deep resources. I think that this relates to the first, but it's actually more about the people at the press. One thing that's been absolutely amazing in, in getting the project off the ground is the support that we've had from creative people in the publishing industry, be that around the marketing um, or the actual kind of structural design of the journal systems. It's been absolutely amazing to work with the experts at Cambridge Press around that. Um, they are genuinely, I believe, committed to a better future for open access research and have been open to a lot of kind of conversations. Um, and I'll, I'll let Jeff talk a bit more about that kind of process now. So our small but mighty team kind of gets together and we have lots of meetings, lots of meetings. <laughs> and, and over the course of, of several years, we start to brainstorm ideas, think about what the vision and, and how that connects to what is feasible with our, our group. Um, we start drafting out proposals that talk about the rationale for this, this journal and, and why this is something that, that um, you know, society would, would benefit from. Uh, lots of different drafts of the proposal, lots of input from peer reviewers, readers around the world. So it, it was a, a collaborative process sort of uh, with multiple people from multiple different industries and figuring out how to scaffold and structure that conversation took a lot of time and, and uh, we had to sort of build up a, a lot of trust. 
So we get to a place where we're happy with the proposal and at Cambridge University Press, in order for something to get the uh, official go ahead to become a journal, it has to go before what's called the syndicate committee, which I love because it sounds like a, like a mafia name, you know, it's going to go before the syndicate. Uh, so we go before the syndicate and we don't pass. And the syndicate says to us, um, we want to see who are the people who would be involved in this journal. We want to know that there's a community of support of interested readers and authors and editors out there. So that put to us the task of we need to go figure out how to build our community. So the journal, we knew we wanted to represent different regions, different disciplines, different periods, different perspectives. We knew we needed a large community to convey the fullness and the, the diversity of the humanities. And we settled on this structure of having editors and then having advisory board members. So the, the editors are kind of the more involved decision makers at the journal who have a little bit higher time commitment or are doing a little bit more of the nuts and bolts uh, work on the ground there. The advisory board members are kind of enthusiastic community members with a little bit less time commitment, but are helping to kind of introduce, make connections between us and the really good readers and the really good writers out there who might want to be, uh, you know, associated with the journal. So, so we start reaching out to some potential editors and some collaborators. Um, and this is where it really started feeling a bit more fun, I think, Jeff. Um, we, we, we've we been working and having, you know, review and feedback from people. But here we suddenly were able to bring in a, a, the plurality of voices that we really hoped that Journal would, would represent. Um, just briefly to introduce you, our current editorial collective who are working hard to um, help us support the themed issues at the moment. We've got um, Ananya Jahanhara Kabir, who's at King's College. Uh, she's expert in interdisciplinary humanities work, making really interesting connections connections between um, textual and non-textual forms of cultural production, specifically around dance and music across the Atlantic and uh, Indian Ocean worlds. We have Julia Kind, who's at uh, the University of Sydney in Australia. She's professor in classics and ancient history um, with expertise in religion, um, but also non-human human interactions in the ancient world. Uh, Sarah Nuttall is at the University of Witwatersand in South Africa and has just finished a decade-long tenure as director of the Witt Institute for uh, Social and Economic Research. Uh, she's published widely around post-apartheid South Africa and has a disciplinary background that spans right across literary, cultural and urban theory, as well as aesthetics. And we have Kobina Apoku Agimang, who's at the University of Ghana. Um, he's a lecturer in English, but also um, is the academic director of the School for International Training. Um, his background is uh, in digital culture and, and media, as well as post-colonial studies. Uh, Ricardo Ortiz at Georgetown University is professor of uh, US Latinx cultures um, and literatures and cultures. And he's also the director, as you probably are aware, of Georgetown's master's program of Engaged and Public Humanities. Um, then we have Manuela Peak, who is an expert in political science, as well as gender and sexuality studies. She also last year coordinated the presidential campaign of the indigenous water defense and Yaku Perez Guatam Tell in Ecuador. Um, and then uh, we have also got Mary Rembrandt Ulm, who's an independent scholar, um, background in literary studies. Um, she's an activist specializing in early uh, medieval England and race as well as Neil Williams, a moral philosopher who specializes in environmental humanities. So I hope from that you get a sense of this, this breadth of disciplinary, um, regional, of, of kind of different stages of their career that we really wanted to co kind of collect together in this uh, collective. And we're, we're really happy that they all said yes. <laughs> and so we start reaching out to the advisory board. We're, we're hoping that we can convince maybe 20 people to, to be involved with our journal. Um, happy to report overwhelmed that that we've got an inaugural advisory board of 92 scholars, practitioners, activists, policymakers from six continents. Apologies to any of you who see your name on there on the screen. Uh, we've uh, put this this sort of community has, has kind of gathered around the, the journal. But I, I think it's fair to say that that um, we're not finished building, that that as we think about the values and we think about the vision, there are definitely gaps in our advisory board, and we want to make sure that we are representing the fullness of the humanities. And so we're, we're continually interested in, in thinking about who would be great to fill those roles in the future. So the website launches on March 22nd, 2024, and there are kind of two main branches of the journal, just to give you a little bit of sense of, of how it works. There's the of the moment section, and then there's the themed issues. So the of the moment section is for 
when scholarly research or personal ex experience uh, allows someone to speak to things that are happening uh, as we speak, uh, the, the big kind of current events, news items, or just the, the ongoing issues of the day, it's fair to say that that's maybe a little bit more public facing, a place for doing public humanities. The themed issues may be a little bit more academic facing, a place for thinking about public humanities and, and, and thinking about the various connections and, and analyzing the, the uh, public humanities work that we see out there. Um, just, just quickly a, a word about our peer review process. So when uh, we, we designed this, we knew we wanted it to be uh, of the moment, but also peer reviewed. And so we've uh, designed a really kind of streamlined peer review process where, especially for our of the moment section, we have a, a turnaround of three weeks from uh, acceptance of the article to publication of the article. And that's been facilitated by the, the uh, organization we've set up with Cambridge University Press. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of just a few other nuts and bolts things, I guess I mentioned briefly about open access. Just to be clear, we are a gold open access journal, um, which offers um, the commitment that no individual author be burdened by APC. So we have the multiple schemes that I can talk through for anyone who's really interested in that, but it covers different different parts of the world in different ways. But also we have that kind of individual promise that, that no, no, no one will be uh, restricted by those fees. Um, the first thing that we're going to put out under our themed issue is a manifesto. Um, it was an amazing process to actually start collecting some content for the journal, and we had over 100 submissions for that. So it's going to be a really exciting issue um, coming out in late 2024. So watch this space. So our issues that we have planned for our first year is issue one, the manifesto issue, edited by Zoe and me. Issue two, historical public humanities, edited by Mary Ramder and Ohm. Then we have an issue on Indigenous public humanities, edited by Manuela Peake, as well as an exciting issue on the Harlem Renaissance and its public, which is looking at the centenary celebrations of the, of the movement. And issue five is Public Humanities in Action, edited by Ricardo Ortiz. Issue six, Public Humanities Across the Disciplines, edited by Neil W. Williams. Then we have an issue on global public literary humanities, which is edited by uh, Tim Lesendorfer and Pavan Malredi, as well as a how-to issue, which is really looking at the practicalities of public humanities work, which is edited by Jeff. Um, I think one story I wanted to end before we kind of get to get to the end of this presentation and hear more from you is some of the challenges that we've been facing because you know this is this is the prospect for what we're going to put together but we have been while we've been launching we've also been learning and one of the really interesting things that's come up about the journal is the um, visual branding and, and, and the important conversation about imagery. Um, it turns out authors care deeply about how their ideas are represented visually and as you'll see on the previous slide there we have quite a kind of bold um, design style that the design team at Cambridge are really excited to to present. Um, I think we all know that represent representation matters greatly, but it's been even more important to think about that when we think about this in the context of um, public life or public engagement. So um, one example we've had is a kind of back and forward about um, use of, of, of art and, and cover imagery. This is a cover that we've kind of got signed off just today from Public Humanities um, around the Indigenous Public Humanities that actually represents the artwork of an Indigenous artist. Um, you know, the press came back and, and was sort of looking for a, for an image of, of, of different colours and things. And we, we had a really interesting conversation about who gets to choose what is represented on the cover and I think there's this this balance between the press and its legal financial parameters that it wants to and, and is obliged to operate within but also about how we share that authority and I think I'm I'm, I'm proud that we sort of won won the uh let's say discussion with this one in terms of uh getting the representation that those in communities feel like best suits them as well as what looks uh nice and shiny <laughs> So we'll say a few quick words about how to contribute with both the of the moment section and the themed issue. So for the of the moment section, this is for when your research or experience allows you to speak to a topic that is alive at the time. And this is the three week turnaround time from acceptance to publication. So we are especially interested in commentary articles that might do a few different things. It might show the humanities at work in public life. It might offer new readings of old texts, objects, events, et cetera. It might use specialized humanities expertise to gloss current events, social life, public holidays, uh, anniversaries celebrated around the world. Um, or we might be interested in, in you know, brief reports of empirical data related to the humanities and public life. Also interested in policy briefs that's informed by humanities expertise for authorities who hold power. So all of those are good fits for the of the moment section. 
And then the second half of the journal or the other kind of alternative route is a themed issue. As I mentioned before, um, you can propose a themed issue um, via a simple form that's available on our website. Um, you're also welcome to contribute as an individual author to a uh, an, an issue we have live calls papers for all of our themed issue there are no closed closed um, editions um, everything is open for a contribution um, and we also encourage you just to reach out to Jeff and I for a chat um, I promise we are genuinely friendly not even just performatively so um, so that's that's kind of the, the the main headlines around themed issues there's a process and the editorial collective those folks you saw earlier uh, meet quarterly to have a look at the proposals for themed issues and talk about um, what, what what feedback or advice we think about moving those forwards. Okay. So just a, a few final words about the, the vision for what's ahead, starting with kind of what we see as our purpose here. So first to provide readers with easy to access humanities knowledge. Second, to increase the prominence of the humanities in public life by inspiring, guiding, and empowering supportive policies and politicians. To provide coverage of the fullness of the regions, disciplines, periods, platforms, and perspectives in the humanities to enhance the power and prestige of centers, groups, and institutions, such as this one here, that are committed to public humanities, uh, to support cultural organizations and the practitioners doing the on-the-ground work of public humanities, and then finally to increase the number and quality of public humanities courses and programs in schools at all levels. And to enact some of this we have plans as well as as purposes so the things that we're looking at doing in the in the medium term would be to explore business models that provide financial compensation for all writing editing and reviewing done for the journal to expand our offerings in multimedia formats beyond the traditions of uh, written publication we are also keen to develop a system that allows for decentralized communication among people in our network um, and to develop sustainable and accessible approaches to hosting public humanities events. We are interested in supporting work in progress um, through workshops around our themed issues or other ideas as well, and developing an approach to translation um, into other languages that will further enhance access to our publications for a wider number of people. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much for listening and um, for for you know learning a bit more about public humanities today. Uh, really looking forward to um, questions, thoughts, comments, and discussion that comes up after this. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and open the floor to everyone else. Oh, how wonderful! Thank you so much for that, and brilliantly done and on time. So we have lots of time for Q and A and some discussion. Um, I see somebody asking for that last slide again. Um, Was it this one or do you want this one? <laughs> I think maybe it's that one, the plans. Hopefully. Um, and, I, and I love the one before. So, so maybe actually um, some folks would like to know where they might be able to access uh, mm -hmm. this information, you know, in another form. Are, are there uh, some of these some of these principles and practices on your website for the journal or or how might people point to the, the this information yes it's uh, there is a lot of it on the website i mean jeff i'm i'm happy to share the slides if you are i mean i don't know what you think about that yeah yeah ab absolutely so and so yeah. some of the the things we talked about at the start mission and values are up on the website some of the things that we talked about toward the end are a little bit more in formation and, and they're part of uh, what we're calling a strategic plan that, that we're developing for the journal. And that is a very much, we have a sense of the goals that we're working toward. We are, the next step is to figure out what's the, the plan for getting to those goals. And then uh, equally importantly, how will we measure success of whether or not we have, have reached the goals to, to help us figure out how practically speaking we can actually you know, get to work on on uh, the, these big visions that we have. Great, thank you, and and thank you, Zoe, for posting the link to the website. Um, so I think we're a small enough group that uh, I'm hoping that I'm seeing everyone on my screen, um, and uh, I think people can go ahead and raise their hands if they'd like to ask a question. And just to make it explicit, I think we're very happy for it to be a discussion and not all conversation needs to run through Zoe and me. We're probably much, much more interested in learning from you and hearing what your thoughts are. Um, so so feel free to just uh, kind of unmute and, and chime in or feel free to, to have an active chat here and looking forward to some good conversation.
Um, I might just take the prerogative and get us started, if that's all right with you. Um, I love so much of what you were talking about, about your um, principles and practices. And as you said, it's aspirational. It's a strategic plan. Um, and a lot of this echoes a lot of what I hear from uh, wonderful uh, public humanities practitioners on my campus that I've been privileged to work with. Um, the one thing that I didn't hear was talk about collaboration with community practitioners. And the, the word collaboration often comes up with these folks that I work with on campus and just sort of hadn't noticed that as a, as a core tenant to, to some of the things. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about um, encouraging um, collaboration uh, with various groups or with uh, uh, between the academy and the wider community um, or how you think about that as, as a value of the journal. Great question. I think it's really important. Um, and, and my first response would be that we spend a lot of time thinking about the things that count as research in the journal and a conversation, you know, it is a academic journal for the public humanities, you know, it's, it's, it, we've chosen to make it a journal with Cambridge Press, because it's, it's, it's designed to kind of intervene in that space. But really, we wanted to have research that people who maybe aren't paid to to do this work nine to five who aren't themselves researchers are able to kind of produce uh, or contribute as as equal authors to the journal so there's a really long list of different article types that people can produce um and and so far i think we've had some success in engaging um people who work within um you know policy contexts and publishing contexts and, and those kind of adjacent um sectors to who have already kind of contributed to the journal i think what's really important to work out is the relationship between more community-based and place-based groups and how we and how we get that right jeff i don't know if you've got any any thoughts you'd want to add about that kind of less professional um but more more you know uh fundamentally public or community-led stuff yeah, I, I would uh, just add, I think it's really important for us to give folks examples of what that looks like very early in our publication uh, process. And, and so that's one thing is to sort of let people kind of see themselves in the journal that there are, you know, uh, community members, non-academics who are publishing in, in this space and that they can see that that is, is happening. Um, and then the, the flip side of that is, I think, we will need to lean really hard on our advisory board to make those connections. And, and so we really encourage our advisory board to, to be active in sort of helping folks uh, get connected up with the journal. And then I guess the, the sort of flip side of that is, is um, I, I think it's probably fair to say that, that our advisory board is, um, you know, heavily academic at the, at the moment. That's sort of where the worlds that we come from, that's the, the uh, you know, the, the networks that we have as we're figuring out whose arms we could twist to, to uh, work with us on the journal. And it will be very important for there to be more representation at the level of the advisory board and at the level of the editors for um, non-academics folks who are out uh, kind of in, uh, you know, community-based work doing those sorts of things so that, that we can make sure that, that we have that fully represented in the journal. Yeah. I think certainly we've got some plans around um, visual arts. We've done, we've had quite a lot of interest and engagement with that um, around the Harlem Renaissance issue, which is also drawing on work happening kind of in art galleries and museums as well. So that's been a really good kind of um, working model that we've we found some um, more direct routes, I guess, to community mm -hmm. organisations. Um, but I think another important issue is around remuneration for work. You know, I think is there's a privilege to be had for people um, being paid to produce research and it be valued. And so we have to think carefully about what we ask of the people people who who are, are or aren't being valued but yeah that's, that's uh, absolutely Zoe I, I I I'm on board with that yeah thank you so much for the that I see a question from Mary Chapman yeah hi thanks um I'm Mary Chapman I'm I was the founding director of the public humanities hub at the University of British Columbia for the past four years I my term ended eight months ago um, so I just love all of this and I'm so excited you guys are doing it. I had a few questions though. I, I hope I didn't miss this. How often is the journal coming out? And then I have another question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the of the moment section is is rolling, you know, publications. So that's sort of as every week, every month we'll bring new issue or new articles there. The themed issues is a little bit interesting. We settled on quarterly for themed issues. 
And then we had this massive influx of submissions. And so the current plan is to publish eight issues in the first year. And then we're going to kind of assess after that if quarterly is the right pace for us to work at, or if we're able to sustain this, this very high volume of publications. Okay. The, the reason I ask is I love the themed issues. I, I feel like it um, demonstrates what your values are and you know what you want to hear from people. But I, but I can also imagine many people not quite fitting into the categories, but having urgent stuff to share that isn't exactly today's news, but is, but is timely in a in a way for public scholars. So, so it occurred to me as I was looking at those special issues that you might want to consider alternating between kind of grab bag great work that you've been sent and and the sort of strategic themed issues but mm. none of my business but I love everything you're doing so thanks I think that's a really useful idea and, and, and piece of feedback actually I think we also I don't know if we kind of communicated in the um presentation but the of the moment pieces are going to be compiled into an issue at the end of the year as well as a kind of uh, year in review of of this kind of public humanities work so we I totally agree and hear you that, that sometimes there's great humanities scholarship that's happening that doesn't it's not a whole issue's worth of content even it's just a great thing or you know it's something that is worthy of being shared without the kind of time lag and scale so i hope the of the moment is partly going to address that but equally it will be really interesting to see you know if the momentum of publication and and interest continues at this pace we are we are certainly going to have room and scope for general issues um that that look at perhaps different ways of defining the public humanities right there's these there's, there's a conversation Jeff and I had a lot in the in the many years of planning this was, you know, is this about the public humanities, for the humanities, of the public humanities? And there is actually all of those things. And we we kind of refuse to compromise on saying we're only going to do this bit. And so that that getting that spread and actually delivering that, I think, is really important. So thanks, Mary. That's important. <laughs> Super. Thanks. Other questions, comments, suggestions? I have my hand up, but maybe you can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, no worries. A beautiful background, and it oh, gets yeah. lost. <laughs> yeah. So, um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was so interesting, um, and I think this might have been touched on already. But my question is: so, so I'm Olga Anjari, and I'm um, a professor of English, and I direct the Mandel Center for the Humanities at Brandeis. Um, and so one of the things, well, one of the things we couple of the things we've been working on at the Humanities Center, um, two things, one is, um, well, one as an English department person, I have worked with my department to kind of um, rethink the PhD to um, encourage more people to do kind of public humanities work and to think about different careers people might go to than the professorate. Um, and thinking about what com community engaged learning, for instance, would do to the PhD. So that means we did a series of reforms where um, we have a, uh, like we can have a doctoral uh, project rather than a dissertation so people can write different kind of pieces for their dissertation that would be directed to different audiences, including community organizations. Um, and just basically try to encourage people to do, kind of think more broadly about what counts as scholarship. So I see that very in line with what you're doing. Um, and then the second part of it, we just hosted an event at the Mandel Center this year on rethinking tenure and promotion guidelines for to include community engaged scholarship. Brandeis has a pretty traditional idea of like what counts as scholarship. So it's like an academic monograph for the humanities and social sciences would count and obviously, when we are looking at uh, public humanities work, it's like uh, there can be many different forms that it would take. So my question, I guess, um, so that's been fascinating. I think we can support a lot of younger colleagues, co colleagues doing um, community engaged work. And I think it's a DEI um, initiative, too, for our teaching and for our practice. Um, as as you said, as the professor, it gets more diverse. I think there's more different um ideals and personal and professional goals that people bring to being a professor um, and being a PhD student that I want to encourage. So so I'm very excited again by hearing about your thing. I guess I'm just wondering how much how much you're thinking about these issues as you develop the uh, the journal. Um, I mean, part of it is also as a journal, it also just it, as you're as you said, it legitimizes public humanities work so that People can say, oh, but I've written about this project in a peer-reviewed journal.
but obviously we don't want to go the fully legitimizing way then it takes out some of the transformational piece of it which is that we have to change i think believe strongly we have to change what we imagine scholarship is who it's for and who we're serving and that is going to be a transformation and as we all know it's often like faculty who are most resistant to make these changes not even administrators yeah so i guess i'm like i guess i'm just interested in how you've um thought about that um as like is it something that's going to be discussed in the journal? Is the journal by your by foregrounding your um your values, you're obviously trying to make some of those changes because they aren't always the same values, but they are, but it is, as you said, also a Cambridge University Press journal, which is, you know, has a lot of academic. Um, and I sorry about the long question. One last thing is like one example of this I was thinking is the um, so the ACLS just changed, or two years ago, they changed their dissertation fellowships, dissertation completion fellowships. They changed them into innovative dissertation fellowships. So, so they, um, and I think that was a attempt to do similar things to what you're doing. But I guess one of the issues with that, as I've seen it roll out over the last couple of years, is that the faculty they get to review the fellowships are unfortunately the same faculty that they got in the first place. And so what they end up doing is they did kind of shift to more kind of innovative work, but it's still very theoretical and academic. And I don't feel like often the, the prize that they're giving are really for people to rethink what we do. So I, yeah, so that's a, sorry again about the long question, but I just, I thought it'd be helpful to hear your thoughts and how you see the journal playing into any of these issues. Yeah, uh, just real quickly, Olga, thank you. That spoke to me in my soul. Uh, <laughs> so so for, for me personally, I'll just speak for myself. Um, myself and a lot of friends are really energized by this kind of work, by, by public facing, engaged work. That's sort of what gets us out of the bed in the morning. Um, I went to grad school 2006 to 2012 and and the deal that I was sold was that you need to be peer reviewed published in order to have a successful academic career. And that deal has just dissolved, right? And, and so I think a little bit of what we're trying to do for the journal is, is to, as you say, provide people a place where they can do the work that really excites them, that also provides institutional credit for that work by being a peer reviewed venue. And then at the same time, as, as you say, kind of the, the the more radical, the more transformational moment is we're hoping to, to be able to be a venue in which some of these conversations about what would it look like to reimagine the PhD and, and to develop different criteria for uh, education where that conversation can happen in a deep and, and uh, you know, technical way in, in a, a, a peer reviewed journal that we can create new knowledge on the other side of that and to be able to be a venue for that. So we're, the, the, the balance we always try to start is we're doing public humanities, but we're also thinking about public humanities and we're, we're hoping to be able to do both of those. Mm. Absolutely, I have little to add than other than I agreed entirely with everything you were expressing and, and underlining as being important. You know, that question you asked about what we imagine scholarship is for, I think is really an important heart of this thing. And it's not, I think there's a real hesitation that I have to be like, it's this bit or this bit, because actually that's not up to me or up to, you know, up to maybe any of us. It's up, up to the, the kind of collective work to express and articulate and, and test that. Um, I hope we just have a place where people who think, I wonder if there is a place that I could think about this kind of thing can go to. And I think that that hopefully is the aspiration I have for the journal, that it's a space to um, imagine that future of, of, of education that is, you know, I think better. <laughs> I have what might be a, uh, like a, just a quick follow-up question to that, which is, um, have you thought about how you're doing the peer review and who's doing the peer review? Um, so I think that's a little bit of what Oko's getting at with the ACLS um, dissertation grants is that if you, if you do peer review in the exact way that it's always been done, you might be replicating some of the problems that have excluded sort of the most innovative or collaborative engaged work yeah 
It's a really important question, Jessica. I think one thing that we've worked really hard on is developing the um, guidelines that we're sending to reviewers. So we have established a kind of very simple process actually for doing peer review that has as categories that say, you know, is this is this knowledge and expertise, but also is this accessible and understandable? And does this, you know, this is designed for a journal that is this word length and this is the tone we're looking for and, and really kind of spells out that it's slightly a different ask than maybe the traditional peer review is the other thing I think that's really worth stressing is this growing volume of people on our advisory board are partly signing up to act as peer reviewers you know so we we've we've accumulated you know over a hundred people who who are interested in this field of public humanities who are committed to to the work in from different you know different perspectives and it's not it's not sort of like I say a level a level thing but we certainly have a group of people who we initially are, are, are there and we really hope it will snowball from that um another thing we're we're kind of encouraging is for guest editors to make suggestions where we're trying to avoid the kind of the clique of of of, of special issues rather than as, as opposed to the thematic issues that we're doing but we are certainly making sure that we're listening to the people who are having their names on the issues as to the kind of appropriate people we might approach and, and speak to about uh, with you as well uh, jeff i don't know if there's anything i missed there uh yeah just just real quickly jessica i, I love that you um phrase it like that, because that really sort of for us crystallizes why this possible financial model of getting financial compensation for peer review work is something that we're interested in exploring, because the folks who are available to do free peer review work for us are all the folks who are tenured academics that that have this free time. If you're a museum worker out there, you know, and you've got your day job and you're trying to, to you have to kind of make judgments every day of how you spend your time. If, if, we want you to peer review something for us. You might be precisely the voice that is needed and be precisely least well positioned to be able to contribute to the journal. And so that that's the, the, the kind of the labor market involved in all of this is something that we're, I think, really mindful of as a sort of kind of phase two for what comes next. And and I, I suppose maybe um, on that token, we, I, I wonder if we might like turn the tables a little bit and just sort of say like, this is a community of folks who have done the hard work of building things in public humanities. Like, I would love to hear what what are we going to come up against that we're not expecting? What, what are the unexpected challenges? What are the surprises that we might face in year one, year two? Um, you know, ha happy for this to turn into a therapy session, um, <laughs> but, but would, would love to hear some wisdom. Go for I, it, Lisa. Oh, hi, Jessica. Um, I'm Teresa Manga. I'm at the University of Iowa. And um, this is not so much a challenge as, as a question. And forgive me if you talked about it and it went over my head. But one of the things I find really fascinating about public work is how often the conventional textual account is <clears throat> just isn't quite adequate to the kind of activity and, and variety of forms that publicly engaged practice takes. And I know y'all have been thinking about this already, but I wonder what Cambridge, um, what affordances Cambridge will have to let you include video, online exhibition, other forms as well as print. Yeah, it's, it's such an important question. Thank you. And, and, I think the biggest affordance is is that they're open to it, and and so that's very exciting right now. Um, once we start talking practical nuts and bolts, um, these uh, at least um, are, aren't for the press. Kind of developed forms of what would it look like to do a peer reviewed video submission, and and knowing that that's precisely the sort of work that is going to most be able to connect with folks is, is something that's very important for us. Um, so there there will be a lot of sort of developing what are the criteria, what are the protocols, what what are the the considerations that need to be brought into it. Um, and and I think a lot a lot of folks are excited about that. Yeah, in terms of the media platforms that we've kind of discussed, um, video essays um, are certainly one that, that seems to kind of come up quite a lot. Um, we've also discussed the idea of producing a podcast down the line and having a podcast series that's available um, associated with the journal. Um, and another idea, which I briefly touched on at the end of the presentation about this work in progress stuff, we're hoping that one of the one of the affordances of the press is that it has um, access to pretty nice video um, hosting, like web interactive seminar video platforms where people around the world can collaborate and and, and kind of produce um a, a virtual seminar which is 
a little bit more participatory than than Zoom. It's not, I mean, it's not amazing still, but it's okay. It's it's, it's quite good. But we can have that as a kind of recorded um, archive as well. We're, we're considering that, and uh, the marketing team are keen to have that as, on a YouTube channel that's publicly available as well. So there's some starting conversations. I think there's a long way to go um, in terms of of kind of actioning this, but I think it's certainly up there on our list of like things that we are ready to go to bat for. So <laughs> bring it on. I, I think one of the real challenges there is, is kind of the, the cross industry or cross specialization things that if, if you're going to do a video that's hosted by Cambridge University Press, that's going to have to go through legal, that's going to have to go through accessibility checks, that's going to have to go through all of these different parameters that, that uh, speaking for myself, I wasn't taught how to do in grad school. And so we're sort of thinking about like, how can we be the bridge that helps scholars who want to do that sort of work actually get to a place where it's technically viable and, and um, able to be pulled off. Like, uh, Mary, we can go to you. Yeah, thanks. I had another question as, as Teresa was asking about affordances because I, I, I feel like we might be talking about a, two different kinds of objects that would be submitted to the, to the journal. So, so one would be like in the thinking about, you know, the second kind of um, contribution, that sounds like a meta thing, a kind of consideration of, a theorization of, a description of perhaps a, pro a public humanities project that has already been built or created or shared. But, but I think Teresa's question might have also been imagining what if the public humanities object that has been created is a video? It already happened. It doesn't necessarily need to be peer approved by your journal to, to be valuable, a, pub, um, a digital uh, project, something like that. So uh, I wonder, that's more of a showcase model than a scholarly article about public humanities. I'm just wondering if there's space for both or if you're imagining both kinds of deliverables. Yeah, I, I mean, I could imagine a world, this would be amazing, right, where we all have events that are going on on our campuses or in our workplaces or wherever we're at. And a lot of times those are recorded. And, and sometimes those are really, really high quality and they deserve a bigger audience than what we were able to get that day where someone sends a, a, a video or a recording of that session to the journal and, and subway basically we just help with the distribution we help it get to a wider audience and we help market it in, in these really fascinating ways um so that that's very early in the process but that's exciting to me yeah i think that the 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 project that we're doing intersects with networks that are already in existence right and and that we're not trying to kind of um detract or or kind of disrupt things that are already working well but we do think that there's a place for I guess a recorded hub right of things of resources of of, of thinking of doing that, that that people can come to and I hope that that's that's it so I think that that sounds right Mary what you're saying um we we are hoping to be able to embed um content like images and videos as well in the articles it's all online only as well um so that does help in terms of um re replicability the one challenge we've come up against using um uh, videos so far is about the kind of the the promise that Cambridge makes that this knowledge is available like forever um, and how how you kind of promise or commit to that it's an interesting question um, but one that we're going to continue uh, pressing on with because you know it's it's uh, going to be necessary. Well, I think we're just about out of time. And I know Jeff has to head to something else at three. So I'm going to wrap us up. But I, I think this is just such exciting work. And, and I think all of us uh, will join me in congratulating you on it and um, hoping to see wonderful things in the future as it grows. Yeah, thank you so much. And and I think for Zoe and me, kind of the inspiration behind the journal, the inspiration behind the consortium is the exact same, which is that there are so many people out there who are like-minded, who are thinking in these ways. And there needs to be a sort of a rendezvous, a place for people to get together and, and compare notes. And so I, I think uh, really similar spirits here. So thank you. Thanks. And join us for the next two sessions of the Public Humanities Network at CHCI, if you can. The, the links are in the chat. See you Wonderful. soon. Thank you all. Take care.